Hello and welcome to season three of the Artist Spotlight with myself, Sydney Jackson, and my lovely guest today, Ruth Fitton. I'm speaking to Ruth all the way from about an hour down the road here in Yorkshire, and I think Ruth's the closest person that I've ever interviewed on the Artist Spotlight. Um, Ruth is self-taught. She's... Um, She's since graduated, has painted full time and started to win awards like the Purchase Award from the ARC in 2021 and the First Place Young Artist Award with the Royal Institute of Oil Painters in 2020. Ruth has exhibited Sotheby's in New York and Arcadia Gallery in New York, which many of you will be familiar with. She's, uh, she's also exhibited at the European Museum of Modern Art in Barcelona. And of course, the Mal Galleries in London. So, if we could please welcome Ruth. Hi, oh, hi Ruth. Hi. Welcome to Yorkshire. Ha ha. Thank you. <laughs> no, listen. It's um, it's a pleasure to have you on here today. And um, I know on behalf of Mum and I, um, we've been following your work now for quite a few years. Um, and just seen you rock it and rock it and rock it. So it's it's just um, fabulous to watch what you're doing and, and see how you're you're gaining momentum. I mean, does it does it all feel like a bit of a, a rat race at the moment, or do you feel like you've got a handle on everything that's coming in your way? <laughs> um, well, things are just cooling off for me. Actually, I've had a, a commission packed year, and it's. Uh, right. It's been quite full on at times, um, but I'm just in the process of the final touches on the final piece on the current waiting list, after which I've blocked off a few months to work on my own work mm -hmm. and works for galleries, um, which is very exciting. I have loads of ideas I want to try, both in terms of compositions and painting things I want to try and um, yeah, I can't wait. I'm very excited. Yeah, I bet. Let, remind me, we've got to come back and explore that a little bit because um, I definitely want to to ask you about your process there with commissions and, and how you break your time up. So once I've got a couple of my burning questions out of the way, we'll, we'll come back and explore that. So I wanted you to tell us where you're calling us from um, or where we're speaking from and how you got there. I guess is is the question. Well, we are speaking from my studio, which is about a twenty second walk from my house, um, in Leeds here in Yorkshire. I've been in this studio for just under a year now. Um, it is it's not the perfect artist studio, but it is um, it's about the closest. Um, well, it's one of the closest you'll get. I have a low ceiling, so I have low windows, but I do also have skylights. I'm sat underneath a skylight at the moment. Um, and to have direct natural light from directly overhead is amazing. And yeah. as you can see, I have quite a lot of space, which is also amazing. Yeah. It's, um, it's a self-enclosed unit. It's the first studio I've been in that I'm not sharing um, a building with a bunch of other creatives. And uh, yes, it feels uh, it feels like I've made it in a way to have my own studio and Your I'm the space. one with the keys yeah. and the kitchen belongs to me. And yeah, it's really nice. Yeah. When you when you have a cup of tea, you wash up your own pot. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so I, I guess um, leading on from that then is to ask what made you then get your own space versus being around other creatives? Well, I have nothing against being around other creatives. Um, I think the main benefit is that I have so much more space here than mm -hmm. I would if I was sharing a building. Yeah. Um, it's not that I don't want to be in a building with other artists. Um, I think if you're sharing a room with other artists, it can be challenging, particularly as someone working from life, quite a lot of the time, you need to be able to control the lighting. Of course. And if you've got someone at the other end of the room that needs all the lights on and you want most of them off, then it can be, you know, yeah. a bit contentious. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think there is, there's a lot to be said for being around other creatives. And I do try and get fellow artists in my own studio as often as possible. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I hold a weekly group with a live model, we have a live portrait model and... Um, 
the doors are open basically for any artists who can make it, who want to come along and paint or draw a yeah. portrait, one long pose. Yeah, standard. I've seen that on your Instagram, um, and by the way, we'll we'll put everything about you and how pit folks can follow you um, after this um, down in the comments. But um, when you follow you on Instagram and you see that you're doing that each week and you're you're bringing in different folks that can come and just you know move their hand, get painting, drawing, whatever it may be. Um, it's it's so good to see, especially as a fellow northerner. Um, I know for a fact that you're going to feel the same as me, that everything seems to happen down in London. And if you're not in London... Or in Manchester. You know, there are a few or Manchester. Manchester. Or Manchester. But God help you if you want to do it in Yorkshire. So the, the fact that you're doing it and to the standard that you do it is a real credit to you, Ruth, honestly. Thank um, you. Yeah. I, I do, I mean it, and, and I can say that as well, because I know I've borrowed some of your models, um, <laughs> you know, and Ruth manages, you, you just manage to get such unique and interesting models who are, they're, they're all different and very professional, and um, they, they all just understand what we're trying to achieve, even though they're not necessarily in the art world themselves which is a huge thing because I think so many folks think that, oh, you know, um, why would you want to paint me? That's strange. You know, I don't, I don't want anybody looking at me for that amount of time. And you've managed to soften that to them so that they know that what they're doing is really helping. Um, yeah. And so when I've ever, you know, whenever I've borrowed one of your models for our workshops, they come so open-minded. They're so willing and giving, you know, and that's a real credit to you. Um, so I just wanted to say that because it, it really is. And it's you can tell when the students are painting at your studio that the, the models are interesting, you know, and they, they yeah. get a lot mm -hmm. from them. So how did you set that up then that folks come to you on a on a weekly basis or, you know, how did that come about? Well, I started it up in my previous studio, which was in Harrogate, also mm -hmm. in Yorkshire, um, and I, I bumped into a couple of artists um, in the area who I already knew, bumped into them at, at an exhibition and we got talking. It turned out, although they were landscape painters, they'd been going to a lot of life drawing classes and I kind of seized the opportunity and said, would you be interested in coming to a regular portrait group? And um, they said, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I just started asking around and I started using a lot of models um, who were pros from the life drawing scene. Um, now I have branched out into, um, obviously with a portrait, it's a lot easier to ask someone to model than if it's a life setup and you need the yeah. nude um, the nude model. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I've had a bit of a snowball effect in that um, I asked a friend who recommended me to a couple of other friends who recommended me to their family and then yeah. maybe one week someone is unable to make it so they arrange a replacement for themselves which is obviously another contact for me which is wonderful yeah brilliant um, I run the whole system um the whole idea is that I want as many different models as possible and I work very hard for that yeah I know people want to see different face types and um practice different things and also that I think there is maybe a limit to the number of times, certainly within a, a period of time, that any model is happy to come and sit doing nothing for three hours. Yeah. Some of them love it. Some of them will come back again and again. But most people, I find, they'll say yes very happily to the second time. And then you have to leave it a while before yeah. you ask them a third time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... I guess um, for anybody who's watching this who um, will now end up starting to follow you on Instagram and see your weekly classes, what advice have you got for them um, to set up? Let's pretend there's somebody in Nebraska, okay, and they think, well, I've got a space and I think I could probably do that. What, what advice have you got for anybody setting up their own um, smaller scale you know it's we're not talking a huge art school here it's a smaller scale group on a Thursday evening um, what would you say to them I would say um, keep going regardless of how bumpy it seems at first um, people want to know that 
there is a group running. So if maybe two weeks in a row you have only one or two people come, yeah. don't give up because people, um, they like to drop in, particularly I think post-pandemic, there's a very kind of ad hoc vibe to a lot of things. Yeah. People will just decide on the day whether or not they're going to come and, you know. Um, so, yeah, don't give up, even if you lose some money for a while because you're paying for the model and, you know, other people aren't there to cover the costs. Yeah. Um, what I'm doing at the moment, actually, I'm I'm not running every week. I'm running two Thursdays and then um, a week off and then a Saturday and then another week off and then two Thursdays. So it's a four weekly cycle. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, I find it makes it easier to get enough models because sometimes it is, if you need a model every week, that can become quite a pressure. Of course, yeah. Um, and it means I don't have to do the, you know, setting up the room and taking it down, yeah. which, you know, it takes half a day out every week potentially, so. Yeah, yeah. And my Saturday sessions are full days um, rather than the Thursday sessions, which are just the three hours. And for the Saturdays, I get people coming from much further afield. Yeah, I can believe um, that. Uh, which is lovely and I uh, I enjoy doing those but again if you do it too often people wouldn't be able to travel from that far potentially every week or every two weeks so yeah yeah well it's still kind of seeing how it goes and ironing absolutely it yeah and and I think that the 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 thing to take from that is not giving up like you say I think one of the huge perks um, of it will be that when it does start to work it means that somebody else is helping you pay for your model fee which is, is great, you know, but there are going to be times when that doesn't happen. And at the end of the day, if you can try and share the costs and put some money in the pot to cover those days, um, hopefully you end up, even if not, making a little from it. But um, it's it's wonderful. And I, I really, I think it's a, a fantastic thing that I would encourage anybody um, to, to set something like this up um, on their own scale from their own uh, studio. Um, because I, I don't know if you agree, but moving away from working with creatives all the time to then being now on your own, though you can control everything that's within your power there, um, I'm sure you probably did miss the interaction, you know, of, of other nutty painters around. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Um, I, I go for, you know, I will quite often go for a whole day without actually speaking because um, it's just me. So, yes, uh, getting people in, you know, once a week, more or less, is uh, it's good. It's yeah. good for me. It's good for the brain and the soul. Yeah. Yes. Well, what I wanted to ask then is, um, as you've taught yourself um, over the years, have you ever considered... Um, different routes than what you've gone down and would you if you were given your time again to do that would you have ever gone back and done anything differently or are you happy with how it's gone well there's two parts to that question so I'll answer the first part <laughs> yeah, sure. first. Um, there was a time when I longed to go to an atelier so we're talking several years ago I was in my early 20s um, say between the ages of you know, 22 to 24 or 25, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, I, uh, I struggled, you know, I was painting a lot from photographs. Back then there wasn't nearly as much information available online as there is now. It's really, you know, exploded in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I was trying to work out as much as possible for myself and I painted a lot of self-portraits from a mirror, which was mm -hmm. good. But um, I, uh, yeah, I had this longing to go to an art school. And then I think the first time I ever got into a show at the Mal Galleries, I, um, I attended the opening. I had, you know, my painting was on one wall. I think it was like the young artist section of the Society of Women Artists. And on the opposite wall, there were two beautiful portraits one of them was a profile and the other was a three-quarter view and they had the you know, same kind of general aesthetic and I thought oh I wish you know if I went to an art school I could paint like this artist and um I thought you know I wonder what this person's called you know maybe I can get in touch with them and they can tell me where they've studied etc etc so I went and I looked at the name label 
went and looked at the name label of the other painting and it was two different people and I had no idea. I assumed they were by the same artist. Now I know that the ideally you go to an art school, you learn everything and then you put in the years to create your own style. But in that moment, I realized that if I went to an art school, I would end up, you know, they would teach me to paint the same as everyone else. And then I'd have to put in all the effort again mm -hmm. afterwards mm -hmm. to move forward from that. And uh, yes, I'm sure it's wonderful for some people, but it was an eye opening moment for me. And I realized, no, that's not what I want. Yeah. I think you've, you've um, hit the nail on the head there for what, what a lot of um, artists that graduate from any brilliant atelier that they they struggle with then finding their own voice afterwards um, because they're, they're taught to paint in such a classical way um, that they are all trying to go through a process but afterwards you really have to then find your voice for somebody to say that's a rude painting you know and it was only before this interview this weekend actually I was I was thinking you really know somebody's made it in the art world. In, in my opinion, making it um, is, is one of the, the definitions is that when you can tell their painting without seeing a signature and without reading that it's that person. And I was thinking, Ruth really does fall into that category. And I promise I'm not just saying that because we're on the, on the call now. Um, I really do mean it. Um, and it, it, th there's no main feat there because... It, it's all well and good that you have a beautiful signature and we can all see that and that's important but I can tell a Ruth painting when I see it you know and that's the, that's I think the thing that folks that that come from an atelier or a school really do struggle with um I'm not saying that they don't find it um but it, it you know it's not necessarily found at school now that being said of course the basics the fundamentals the the, the hours that you learn yeah. I mean, can you imagine having a model for 10 hours a day and just knowing that you can drop in and drop out? You know, it's things like that, that there's, there's a lot of plus sides to it. The connections that you make within the art world, you know, things like that. But th there is really strong cause for both. And I can see both very clearly. Um, so, yeah, I, I understand your longing to want to, to join, um, mm -hmm. but then also your acknowledgement that it, you wouldn't have your identity perhaps so fast and so clearly you know so that being said then would you now do anything differently or or are you are you happy with the, the path you've gone if you could have told yourself something then um I think I could have done with well I've, I've taken a couple of workshops right and yeah. um, a turning point for me was actually um, watching a an online course from Joshua LaRock yeah. in 2019. I think I could have done with that sooner. Yeah. And I think maybe if I had, um, if I'd made the investment to go on, you know, a short workshop or something with somebody who had been trained, who could, you know, talk me through all the, um, like the grammar and the structure of things at an earlier stage, I think it probably would have been useful. I know that I did flounder for a little while. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. You got there. You got there in the end. <laughs> well, so, getting there. <laughs> no, you got there. Trust me, you did. Um, I guess on that note then with the uh, with Joshua LaRock, let's just talk about when you met Josh then. Because obviously um, Joshua came here this summer, it feels like a long time ago now. It's actually, it was in May this mm. year, so just before summer. Um, and I'm calling Ruth right now from our workshops in Yorkshire Studio, which is, um, it's a branch off of Rosemary & Co., but it's where we invite the best of the best to come and teach here. Um, and so even though I've got my Rosemary & Co. hat on 95% of the time, 5% of the time, we host uh, teachers and then welcome students and so Josh actually uh, came and taught here and Ruth took Josh's workshop which you know I, just to explore that for a moment before we get into the fact that um, what you know what you took from a workshop like that but I really think it's um, a credit to you and, and I, I already said this in the past about our, I know it's a mutual friend of ours Heidi Jo um, 
to be able to take a workshop when you're already at a certain level um, and ad- not like admit, because that's not the, the phrase that I'm looking for, but more like an understanding that you're still wanting to learn. I think that is absolutely huge um, because there has to be an air of arrogance around a lot of people where they think they don't need to go on these workshops anymore. They don't need to, to learn. They've already established. But I mean, I watched it with Daniel Keyes. Daniel Keyes took a Jeremy Lipkin workshop in the Sierras with us, you know, and you think, Daniel Keyes? Really? Like, but he wanted to get something from it, you know. Mm-hmm. So how how did you find the workshop itself, learning from Josh directly? Yeah, it, it was wonderful. Um, I mean, watching, watching a course online is one thing, but being able right. to actually, you know, be putting it into practice on the spot and then the teacher themselves comes around and says, okay, what are you working on? You know, yeah. is there anything you're struggling with? Any questions? I like this bit. Can you work on this bit? You know, what's going on here? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's something else. Yeah, yeah. Josh is Josh is um, an exceptional teacher too. I mean, um, he's very um, methodical with his approach. And he basically tries to give you, what, four, four years worth of the GCA in a week, which is just no way he can do. Um, but I think you'll agree with me, how he presents his workshops, he's very organized very methodical very um he ensures that there's no magic you know yeah Mm -hmm. do you see what i mean by that like he's making it very clear that it's not magic that we're doing here you you need to learn a process and i think especially the common person me included would see a painting and think oh it's magical i don't know how they achieved it whereas josh really brings you back down to earth and goes mm-hmm. okay so it's like this you know yeah i mean i mean his paint if anybody's paintings look like magic you know it's josh's yeah. kind of they have this intangible quality because of all the layering he does and um the likeness is so specific and the form is so wonderful and yeah um it's it's just really generous of him that he breaks it down from the bottom up and yeah. says you just do this and then you do this and then, and you repeat the process and it's yeah um have you found then that that's helped you um, in in how, not of course, obviously, in how you paint and how you understand, but how you then teach um, yourself? Uh, how I um, teach other people, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I think so. I think, I mean, I've, I've attended um, a couple of other workshops both in person and online and tell, can you tell us yeah. who, you, who you've studied from just so we can see who you admire you know um I've taken in-person workshops with Michelle Dunaway yeah. and with Josh Larocque and online oh I don't know if I can remember them all it's not that many um Michael Michael Klein yeah and Joseph Todorovic yeah uh, Stephen Asael recently I took a couple of his webinars um, if I think of any others I'll let you yeah, know let us know yeah all great paint but all quite mm. different yeah you know yeah there's, there's always something different to pick up from them the um, the Stephen Asael webinar was uh, basically about sketchbook keeping which is you know it's a completely different um, sphere of of the art career but it was it was fantastic yeah really loved it um but yes i think uh what i picked up from josh's both the online demo and the workshop was the value of being told clearly you do this and this happens Mm -hmm. if you have this problem you do this to fix it um Josh's whole approach is like it's a problem solving you know constantly check it this way check it that way um, he doesn't just tell you what to do he tells you what to do when it doesn't look like how you you know, first put it down and I yeah. think that is something which I try and um, transfer when I'm in turn teaching yeah um, and exhausting I have to admit when we mm-hmm. you know when the workshop was on and it you know a lot of folks think nine to four oh, that's going to be easy um four o'clock comes and you can just see people's brains fried because (laughs) but it's a lot of learning you know and it's super intense and a lot of folks haven't studied from a live model for that amount of time before or in in that amount of time you know um and so all all of that combination together also being in the room with an idol it's hard because you don't want to 
overdo it that you know you're so excited but at the same time of course you're excited you've paid a lot of money to be with somebody that you are super excited by you know so I'm, I'm sure people already feel that by you um I'm, I'm sure they do and I can just see it now it's going to go up and up and up that folks will just feel you, you'll start to feel it too where you you, you you probably already do where you know that folks are really hanging on to your every word and you're thinking <laughs> Ah. <laughs> I had an experience the other week. I walked into an art gallery and the lady behind the desk says, are you Ruth Bitten? <laughs> there you go. And, and did you say I am? Have you sold any of my work? <laughs> no. no, I didn't. But, uh, well, I mean, I did, I did say I am. But. Yeah. So I guess then the, a, a point of that is that the, the recognition side to it as well is then... Um, just understanding that people um, do follow and do want to learn and, and that your knowledge is um, important enough that they're asking the question, you know, and it's, I, I'm sure people like Joshua struggled with that at the beginning, just like you will over time and then start to realise that the proof's in the pudding. When you see someone's painting, you can't lie. If you can paint, you can paint, but it's a whole different thing being able to teach, you know, it really is, I think. So, Tell me then, um, I wanted to, to touch on um, Michael Klein because he's a good friend of mine and I know that you've um, admired Michael's work for a long time and yeah. followed him. So I know that in 2020, you won an award. I'm just checking to make sure I got the right date there um, with through Michael. So tell us about that, how, how it came about and, and what the effect was afterwards. Well, um, Michael did this uh, wonderful thing. I think he... He ran three or four competitions, um, not so much for um, for the credit of winning a competition, but in order to bring people together. Mm-hmm. And the idea that uh, people could learn by looking at each other's work. Mm-hmm. So uh, he did a still life and a landscape and a portrait. I can't remember whether he did a figure, um, but he would produce one reference image and Um, anyone who signed up was sent the reference image and everyone painted the same thing and um, afterwards all the images that were sent in were posted and everyone could look at each other's work Mm -hmm. and see where other people had done things differently see if there were you know recurring mistakes or things to improve on Um, people could contact each other about it and I think it was a nice way of getting a sort of community thing absolutely. going. Yeah, absolutely. Without it being, you know, drastically expensive. Mm-hmm. So. And then, and, and the end result was? I, uh, yes, I won the portrait. Um, <laughs> yes. The portrait one, yes, which was lovely. Yeah, that's brilliant. And we'll make sure as well. In fact, Ruth, when we announce that this is out um, in the next couple of days, I, I'll ask you if you can repost that picture of the painting okay. that won just so, so that new folks that follow as well can can find what we're referring to and i'll i'll uh, make sure we spotlight that but it's a beautiful piece i mean was that really one of your first awards would you say it was my second award i had just the month previously or two months previously won the emerging artist award with the royal institute of oil painters which is huge yeah yeah so I do, I consider the piece I painted for that Michael Klein competition was like, it was the piece where suddenly everything I'd been working on for the last seven years or whatever it was, suddenly everything appeared on the canvas all at the same time and things clicked and things worked. And it, it was like the start of, I guess, the, the exhibitable work really, yeah. um, or the start of what I now paint. Yeah. Wow. So on that line, I want to pull back to what what we first discussed when you first came on um, with us, Um, when you were talking about commissions versus your own work and and what you wanted to do. So tell us more about that. Do you still take commissions? Are you going to slow those down? What made you do them? You know, all the the good stuff. Okay. Well, um, when I first... Um, decided to be a professional artist um, the idea was that I would paint portrait commissions I didn't really consider anything else um, 
I knew that I could paint portraits. So I'd just done a degree in music, but I spent most of the time drawing and painting. And by the time I graduated, I'd done various small commissions for friends and then friends' parents. And um, I didn't really know what career I would pursue in the musical field. And, you know, I'd already earned money from painting portrait commissions. So it just seemed like the most logical thing to attempt. Um, so commissions was always the plan. Mm -hmm. um, I think partly because um, getting a portrait likeness is quantifiable. Um, so much about painting is very, very subjective. But if you paint someone and it looks like them, it's, you know, um, it is quantifiable. And uh, there's already a kind of inbuilt success there mm -hmm. almost. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I did for, for many years. I uh, I did pretty much only commissions or between commission pieces, I was just practicing technical things. I've got to the point where I'm represented by um, Fine Art Commissions, which are a wonderful agency based in St. James in London. Mm -hmm. and they're just around the corner from the Ritz. <laughs> How posh. I've never been in, but you know. I was um, going to say, I thought maybe you did the commissions in there. <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, they've been giving me lots of work, which is wonderful. Um, ideally, I uh, I think a balance of 50-50 with commissions and with non-commissioned gallery work, I think that would be um, kind of best for my temperament. Mm -hmm. I love painting non-commissioned pieces. I love having, you know, the ideas and I sketch quite a lot. Um, I sketch ideas from my imagination and pictures I want to paint or if I see a painting by another artist, I like the um, uh, naturalist kind of pre-Raphaelite, that kind of era. Mm -hmm. I love their work and often I'm inspired, you know, I'd love to paint something in a similar setting or, you know, and so I sketch ideas out. Um, so I absolutely love doing that kind of thing. At the same time, um, there is always a pressure that if you're painting a non-commissioned piece, um, is it going to sell or if it's unlikely to sell, is it going to be um, monumental enough to be worth doing? Mm -hmm. Is the concept striking enough to make it worth doing? I have a real, um, uh, I'm not quite sure what the word is. I really want to avoid um, painting vacant pretty women yeah. as decoration. Yeah. That is something I hope I never do. And yeah, I always try to avoid it. Um, it's just not, doesn't sit well with me. Mm -hmm. So consequently, um, you know, I'm always looking for a narrative or a compositional concept which makes the painting worth something, um, which can become a, a lot of pressure if yeah. that's all you're doing all the time. Yeah. Which is where the commissions come in, because often that's just it's a head and shoulders or it's a half or three quarter length. And yeah. um, the painting just wants to look like the person. Obviously, you know, you want to interpret and translate and make it very beautiful. But um, it's bread and butter, which yeah. is wonderful um, when you've spent however many months working on a piece that you have no idea if anyone's ever going to buy it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, half and half is great. Yeah. If it was all commissions, then you you begin to feel a little bit like a commission machine. Yeah. You're just painting say. head and shoulders, half length, full length, head and shoulders, head and shoulders. Is there any advice that you would give um, to anybody taking on a commission as like core principles, if you like, that you, you've, you've established that you say, I'm not prepared to do it unless X, Y, and Z, you know, um, is there anything that you can give as like an insight as big no, no's maybe even, um, it's a good question. Uh, there are projects I've done which I probably would not do again. Yeah. Um, I've, uh, I find it, um, obviously, if you, ha if you have to be working from photo references, um, these days I'm very glad that I'm in a position that I can turn down photo references that just aren't suitable for right. making into paintings. Right. Whether that is the quality or... The lighting, you know, often what is a lovely photograph is not a lovely painting. 
you know, there might be really bright sunlight that's cutting the face in half or um, a smile, which if you painted it is just going to look frozen. Mm -hmm. um, I have, I painted some interesting things. I painted um, a full, no, three quarter length standing figure um, on, I think it was about a three foot high canvas from a Polaroid from the 60s, which was this big and it was faded to green. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> and I used that image and I used a different image of the same lady's face close up from a you know, completely different event. Yeah. And I had to use a lot of extra references that I found online for painting the figure and so forth. Would you, was... would you do that one again? <laughs> <laughs> no okay yeah so they're learning curves right and and are you basically saying that now you feel fortunate to be in a position that you could say I can't do that yeah 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 okay and um, which is it's a tough one because often if it's like a posthumous portrait there's a, a real emotional thing you don't ever want to say no to somebody who wants a picture of their loved one that they've lost of course so there's a lot of tact involved and sometimes it's just a case of getting a feel for that person and um, do I feel that actually even if the reference is not great it's going to make this person so happy that it would be worth it yeah it's, justifiable. Um, it's the, the, that's kind of the other element of doing portraits it's a very human um, experience and it's a lot about people and yeah would you ever do pets? No. Oh! I do not do pets because there are so many people that paint animals beautifully and it doesn't particularly interest me and I get a lot of requests for pets and I know that if I started painting them, all those people would be sharing them and all their pet-loving friends would be wanting yeah, them. And opening the floodgates. <laughs> so I'll tell my dog Max that it's a firm <laughs> no from Ruth, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but it's not funny that it, it's like certain things you know that that's just not your interest and other things that you, mm -hmm. you know that you couldn't have enough time in the world to explore more you know that's amazing okay back to some of my questions a second so I wanted to then go back on ourselves I know this is all over the place but um, I'm going to make a public announcement and apologize to anybody who's watching this that thinks that I'm more all over the place than normal which I normally am anyway um, but I have baby brain um, because we're having a baby in seven weeks and my brain is like here 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 so Ruth I'm desperately trying to keep us on a track so apologies um but back to the ROI, let's just talk about the ROI for a couple of minutes, because um, I know that this is an institute that you're um, becoming more and more involved in. And uh, for anybody in England, they will know about the ROI, the Royal Institute of Oil Artists, but not everybody around the world knows about them. So can you tell us a little bit more about the ROI, um, your involvement, what you've seen over the last couple of years from the ROI and, and opportunities that are there? Okay, well, um, the Royal Institute of Oil Painters, um, I believe they were founded 150-something years ago. Wow. Um, maybe 154 this year, I'm not entirely sure. Um, and right now what I know about them is they are just a society of people who love to paint yeah that is the one thing which hits you in the face if you look around one of their shows yeah. or if you go to the private view and meet them all um a lot of them are plein air painters um not all but quite a lot and they are people that just love getting out there with their paints and you know they paint they, they can i've seen pictures of you know huge grand cityscapes Mm -hmm. I've equally seen paintings from them of back alleys with bins in them, mm -hmm. which just by the the painterly touch and the joy of the medium, they become art. You know, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a pretentious painting in one of the ROI shows. It's just painting. Yeah, I'd have to agree with wonderful. you there. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's a great society for young people. I think they are really moving in the direction of getting more and more young people on board. Um, 
the process to become a member can be very drawn out and I think they are um, taking steps to make it less prohibitive because it seems like a really long journey yeah. um, on paper. But yeah, and they do, um, obviously they have an annual open exhibition and they have a whole bunch of prizes for under 30s. Yeah. Um, I've won three of them in the three years that I've exhibited there. Which is brilliant. Um, and they have friends events. If you become a friend of the ROI, they host um, plein air paint outs um, throughout the year. And they have events during the show. Mm -hmm. um, they have a portrait evening where you have, I think, about 100 minutes to paint a portrait of a model. I think they had three models last time I was there and uh, 50, 60 artists, something like that, uh, both members and non-members and members of the public just coming along and painting the portrait for an evening Which with is brilliant. mince pies and wine. It, yeah, it, it's brilliant. It, it, to me, I have to say, in the last couple of years especially, I've noticed how much more inclusive they're trying to be to a younger demographic, um, but also a wider demographic. And um, I know I mentioned this to you before, but David Curtis is a good friend of mine, and he was obviously was, um, I think he was ex-president of the um, Royal Institute of Oil Painters for quite a long time. For right? many years, yes. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't tell you how many years, but... Um, he, he's super well respected within the, the painting scene in the, in the UK, but I also know around the world. And David said to me this summer, at a show that we had Pat, called Pat Chins, um, he just said, said to me, you know, if you, if you speak to any young artist, get them to get involved because we're really trying to pull through the younger talent, you know. And I, I think that they really are trying to do that, that, you know, in the past, maybe it has been laborious to get in and, and perhaps, you know, an old boys club and they really don't want it to be that anymore. Um, and so I just wish that I lived closer because like you, you know, to be involved in some of this stuff, you have got to go down to London. Um, now, I was going to ask you then, so their paint outs and things like that, do they do them all around the country? As far as I know, yes. Yeah, OK. Um, I'm actually, I'm up for associate membership this year and I believe... If I become an associate member, um, I will be uh, allowed to volunteer to host one myself. Brilliant. I so think. you can bring some to Yorkshire. Because um, I think I, I know of a couple of associate members who have hosted them, I think. Yeah. Well, we'll um, look into that. But the main thing is that there's an opportunity then for folks around the country, because not everybody can get down to London, like we've said before. Well, exactly. Yes. So that'd be brilliant. That'd be really great. Next thing I'm going to ask you then about is now we've talked about art in the UK and in London and in Yorkshire. Um, I know that you've got some artwork going to space. <laughs> yes. So can you tell us more about the artwork that is going to the moon, Mars, the moon? Yes. The moon. The moon. The moon. Tell us um, more. Uh, well, um, in 2020, I had some work selected by the Art Renewal Centre. Uh, a painting called Things Not Seen, which you might know from my Instagram. And uh, they decided to include Things Not Seen in the selection of artwork that they were putting forward for a project called the Lunar Codex. Um, the Lunar Codex is a big cultural time capsule project, basically. Um, I think there are there are now lots of people involved. It's, it's got, got quite big. Um, it's grown quite a lot, which is great. Um, it's, I think it's going to be the first um, major cultural time capsule of this kind to be landed on the moon in about 50 years. So it has been done before, but this is the first one that includes any female artists. So that's a big deal. Yeah. Um, and the deal basically is that all the paintings that are included um, get copied using microfiche technology, um, which I don't fully understand. Uh, copied, but I understand. Yeah. What, what was that word? Microfiche. Okay, right. I think it just becomes a tiny, tiny chip, which can be read using a microfiche reading machine. With you, okay. I'm See? probably completely butchering the terminology. <laughs> But that's um, what's going to space then, not that's the painting. That's going to space, not the actual painting. It's a tiny, tiny copy because they're I'm including thousands of paintings in these, um, 
things which are basically going as freight on rockets which are going anyway so One it's thing not I like hope the, to God the trip is being is, made specially it's just that they are going as cargo i hope to god that it's not via fedex because boy do they let people down on cargo <laughs> 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 this has to be more professional than the fedex uh, the shipping department in the uk <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing so i mean wh- how did that even come about through the ARC, I know you mentioned that, but did you apply f- for it through the ARC or? No, they. Um, uh, I th- think the the project sort of came about after the submission process, and so they just selected some from their finalists. But um, that's brilliant. I think I read that all of this year's finalists are also going to be included in a different sort of sector of the same project, um, because the. Uh, um, the actual space flights have been delayed for about a year now. Um, I don't know if that's usual or not, but um, so I believe that all the finalists' work are going to be included, which means that I get three further paintings, which will also be going. I mean, this is really cool. I, I don't know why I find it so cool because we're never going to see it, um, and I don't ever plan on going to space. But it, it's a very cool thing to know that your artwork is up there. I don't know why, you know. Yeah. Do, yeah. do you agree? Very much so. It's cool, yeah. isn't it? Okay. I'm, I'm glad that you also think it's cool. Um, so back down to earth um, <laughs> on that note, um, I wanted to talk to you about um, the, well, just swooping in because Rosemary will kill me if we don't talk about it, my mom, but brushes. So we obviously are very excited because um, Ruth has agreed to do a brush set with us, the Ruth Fitness Essentials brush set. And I'll make sure again that we put a link down below. Um, But just as a little bit of background to that and and how we came about that was um, that Ruth, I I, I couldn't tell you how many years now, but I know you've been using our brushes for for a long time. Um, and it's it really a brush set comes about when it's organic and it naturally just happens that you you are using our brushes day in day out and you, you know what you need um, and we know that enough people are asking us um, you know what's Ruth using you know now it's funny because we get two types of artists and we get people like Dan Gerhartz who quite honestly could have the entire brush range as a brush set. And then we get people like Ruth who say, well, I only use, you know, 10 to 12 brushes. Um, but those 10 to 12 brushes are what I use day in, day out, you know, and that's just the way I paint, you know. Um, and so, and it's really interesting to me that you're using different brushes than a lot of folks are tending to use. And I'm not saying that we, they don't use them because, of course, they do. We wouldn't do them if they didn't. But, you know, some of your favorites are completely different for what a lot of folks will have ever seen, heard, used, or even thought about. So, can you, I don't know if you've got any of them there. Um, I do have a few, yes. Did you know? You probably knew I was going to ask you something about brushes, but the I, I wanted you to tell us a little bit about some of the bristle brushes specifically um, and what you use them for, um, because I know we're going to get asked, so you're helping me with my job here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, I have here one of my very favourite brushes. Okay, this here is goes. a 3077, I bet. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's upside down. Showing it to the camera and it's upside down. There we go. So yeah. this is a bristle brush. You can see. I mean. This is, a, yeah. I think it's been used once. It, it was used by one of my students yesterday. Okay. Um, 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 so really, what, what would you, I mean, just a, a huge disclaimer to anybody here, that these are our student grade bristle brushes, <laughs> but Ruth loves them. So what are you using it for? I use them um, kind of at the at two painting points. So um, I often do um, a bit of an eboche layer. Um, so I, after I have my basic drawing, I like to um, do a thin pass over most of the painting, which tells me what colours and values are going where. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think most people do this with like a, a stiff ivory brush or something and some solvent. But, right, they do. Yeah. Um, for whatever reason, I I scrub so much when I do this, and I like the texture that you get from scrubbing. 
mm -hmm. um, that actually these bristle brushes work really well. I find if I use a, an ivory, it's so tight and so precise that I'm really yeah. fighting it. Yeah. Whereas these have, um, they have a kind of freedom to them already because they are um, already quite splayed just in their natural format. That's their nature, right. That, I think that part of that just, you know, in brush making is um, just an inexpensive bristle that they're never ever going to hold their shape like a <laughs> regular bristle brush. Um, but what's so interesting is that you, you like that brush coming straight from us like that. A lot of people would turn around and say, you know, that's how my brushes end up. And I, there's a use for everything. And I get that. But you like that from the start. Yes. Well, I, uh, I do have other brushes that start off neat and I like them neat, but I also like them scruffy. So they kind of have a life cycle. Yeah. And yeah. I have two different sets. I have my new red dots and I have my old red dots and it's almost like having two different brushes yeah yeah um, but I also use these um, later on in the process when I'm um, if I already have um, paint on the canvas I find um, if I can scoop up loads of paint on these brushes and again it's the kind of scribbly scumbly effect um, they put the paint down in a really nice organic way and they let me do whatever I want with it in terms of the texture and playing with texture is something which I love to do. So. so on that note, just a quickie on the 3077s, because I know folks will go and look at the website after you've talked about them there. Am I right in thinking that for the price, you're not precious about them, or do you still go about cleaning them in a different way, or, you know? Um, I, I treat them with the same respect I would treat the rest of my brushes, um, which is... Uh, I would say it's kind of a middle middle range amount of respect. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I uh, I tend to just um, uh, use like an oil bath from day to day. So I just you know dunk them in some safflower oil and leave them in a tray. Yeah. And then at, at the end of a week, I will um, rinse them all out with zest it. Yeah. So they're not getting the solvent put through them every day because I'm using them every day. Um, yeah. I was going to say, is, is that because you're using them every day that you would do that process? Yes. Um, well, I spoke to um, one of your lovely brush makers many years ago now. And I said, you know, my brushes are all, you know, they're splaying quite quickly. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm washing them with solvent and then with soap every day. So they're really clean. So I don't know why they're splaying. And he said, well, you know, if it was your hair, would you wash it every day? You're over cleaning. Exactly. So he said, if you're painting every day, you don't need to clean them every day. Yeah. You know, not with oils. Yeah. So. I think it's, it's a really tough one because in your mind you think dirty oil paint must clean. And it's really difficult as a brush maker for us to say anything other than that you don't need to overdo it because it makes us look like we're just trying to sell more brushes. And of course, it's, it's not, the, not the point in this. The point is that actually oil cleans oil. Um, and quite honestly, if you are using them day in, day out, you don't need to do the full strip back like you've just mentioned. Um, and it, I'm telling you, it, it's something that we get asked on a daily basis. So maybe at some point um, I could urge you and see if you would do it um, to make like a little five minute video um, on brush cleaning um, that we could put on our channel for, for no other reason than folks like to see different things, you know, and everybody does it differently. Um, but really, if it works for you, I mean, you're better at telling folks it works for you than w what I ever could, you know, that's the truth in that. So, but yeah, so back, back to the brushes in the set then. So you've got some grainy bristly ones. Tell us about a couple of the others. Um, I've also got a couple of ivories, I think. Yeah. Um, some ivory flats. So they're the synthetic ones. Just one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they are wonderful for um, an initial drawing. Yeah. I never do a detailed drawing. It's just structural lines, which obviously you want them to be precise. Uh, um, is that another word for blocking in? Is that what you... Um, you I don't... To? I'm not entirely sure. To be honest, I've heard block in refer to an initial drawing i've also heard it referred referring to an initial paint pass yeah so, okay um, and you're yeah. saying that you're using those brushes for drawing yes yeah yeah okay. uh, initial lines showing me where the the head is what the structure of the head is going to be yeah 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 um but i also use them um 
if ever I know that I need a really sharp edge, yeah, um, because obviously it, this is a, it has a sharp edge point and it's tight and it's very, um, it's quite stiff. So it's going to it's going to be very accurate. Yeah. So if I need sharpness or accuracy, um, I go for one of these. And sometimes if um, I mean nobody's completely disciplined about what brush they use, right? So um, sometimes if I just need to apply paint to an area um they're great for just you know getting it on scooping it up and yeah blocking it in putting it on so and i also have in the brush set some red dot brushes so for anyone who's wondering i think it's important that we mention the red dot are synthetic um I actually don't know how you came across the red dot because most folks tend to use the red dot for watercolour, but they have transitioned to oil because they're synthetic and they're just a bit softer than a lot of the other synthetics out there. Well, I came across them, Simi, at the Vision X demo two summers ago. There you go. When you gave me some and said, try them. <laughs> try them. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So there we are. Yeah. And yeah. I do. I also use the golden synthetics, yeah. um, which are similar but not exactly the same yeah um in both cases i like the pointed rounds um this is this has got paint on it um this is a one that's still fairly pointy yeah um and i use them until they look more like this yeah i knew and that you've got some that look like this <laughs> so I, I get everyone Everyone I know or I've met since we announced the brush set have said, um, are they only putting in the new ones or are you sending them your old ones for them to also put in the set? <laughs> so, uh, but they know that then the, the point from that is that they know how you wear them down and that you mm -hmm. can use them in different stages. So in other words, you're saying to folks, don't throw them away, right? Absolutely As, not, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, they're beautiful when they, they have a lovely springy point and you can use them for detail work. They're also wonderful like this. You're past the point of caring about keeping the shape. You can just, you know, mix with the brush on the palette, scoop up a lot of paint. Yeah. And because they're so soft, they're wonderful for applying paint on top of wet paint. So layer um, on layer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which if you were using, uh, you know, a, either a bristle brush or something like an ivory, you have the risk of taking off the Pulling paint. Pulling it off, underneath. absolutely. Yeah. No, it's a great point. A lot of folks struggle with that, um, and a lot of folks can't understand how someone like yourself can layer on layer without pulling off. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, truth be told, a lot of it is down to your brushes to make sure you've got a softer brush than the initial layer. Um, and the master's choice, of course, do that. They do. Um, but the, the, I think the red dot have found a little purpose within the oil painting world. And like I say, truthfully, they were never intended for, mm -hmm. for, for oil artists. They were, it was the simple fact that Kalinsky Sable is banned in, in the United States. Um, and so we had to come up with a synthetic alternative. And so that's when um, Mum started designing the red dot. And watercolorists, you know, Kalinsky Sable's their lifeline. Um, so that's then when we were able to introduce those. So it's interesting that you find that they are yeah. nice for oil too, you know. Uh, yeah, I also find they have them. Um, they have more of a um, a spring and like a core strength than the Master's Choice. So they if do. I want to get lots of paint on the brush, I can still do that. Whereas the Master's Choice, you push them, they bend. They're floppy. You know, with yeah. these, they, they have more resistance to them, even though they're really soft. Yeah, I agree. And that's partly just being synthetic. In truth, synthetic's always going to yeah. give you that bit of spring. Uh, but it, it's also why they go out when you when you wear them down, because synthetic don't wear down, they wear out. Whereas your master's choice will wear down. So as, mm -hmm. as you start, they will start yes. to go, you know. And the bristle ones as well, they wear to a kind of teardrop shape. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, whilst we're just talking brushes um, at this this kind of level, and I know there's a lot that folks wonder about on this, um, I just wanted to give a shameless plug to our new Facebook page. Um, I set up a Facebook page this last week, um, called, and I think, just from memory, it's the official Rosemary & Co. Facebook group, something like that, if you search it. Um, and um, just so you know, Ruth, I've made sure that anybody who's got a brush set with us is marked as a brush expert. So if any 
anybody ever asked questions and any of you folks ever replied, um, people know there's an elevation of, of somebody who really understands not just brushes, but our brushes and what they're discussing. Um, but the intention of the, of the group is brushes, brushes, brushes. It's not there to, to post finish paintings or um, anything like that. No, no other reason. And there's a million groups out there for that. This, it, this is brush talk. So it's exactly what you just said then, Ruth, about um, explaining how you clean your brushes, how you use your brushes, the different purposes for different brushes, how you store them, you know, all that sort of thing. So it, and it's really, um, even though it's only been a week, we've got 1,100 members already, which I thought was brilliant, but um, it's already becoming a, a, a really good um, source, you know. So for folks who want to ever join that, just let us know and just... Um, head on over to Facebook and you can you can click and join that so um, the last thing I'm, I'm conscious of time I don't want to keep you for much longer I know you're busy um, but the last thing I wanted to talk about is um, our little project that we've put together um, that is happening on the 4th of December I'm right aren't I it's the 4th it's the Sunday um, at five o'clock in the UK time which is uh, different times all around the world. So you'll have to <laughs> type in on Google five o'clock UK time and work out what time that is for yourself uh, watching this wherever you are. But what we've started to do from the workshops in Yorkshire base here um, is a, a live stream um, session. And Ruth is going to kick us off, which is, is so exciting, Ruth. Um, for no other reason than I know that you're going to be brilliant. You, you're, you, you have such a great way of explaining things and being in front of the camera. I've seen you now twice with Vision X and obviously at various other things I've seen you paint. But um, it's, it's going to be a really um, special three hours where you can talk us through a process. And if I'm totally honest with you, it, it's a way that folks who wouldn't normally be able to attend a workshop, perhaps couldn't afford to attend a workshop, uh, couldn't travel, etc. They, they're going to be able to see you. So tell us a little bit about what the live stream is going to involve. So I decided um, so many people do an Anna Prima portrait demo and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I love doing that myself. Um, but I thought it would be nice to show something a little bit different. So I'm bringing a sort of half length figure to the table um, we're working from reference images just for simplicity, yeah. setting up, you know, this is the first live stream, etc. Um, so we don't have to have the extra cameras and the model and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I have a reference image of um, a sort of narrative pose, and I think everyone's going to be sent the reference image. They will, they? yeah. Yeah, so we they can see what I'm working from. We'll send that the morning of. So yeah. folks will, you know, folks who signed up um, will get that email the day of, which has got the link and the, the image so that they can't lose it beforehand. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, things like picture making and um, how to how to make sure that the idea you have in your head um, is what turns up on the canvas yeah. and um, how to translate from... Um, either the live model or the photo reference. We'll talk a bit about invention and use of imagination. Um, there's a lot to cover. Uh, and obviously my um, kind of figurative paintings um, usually take me a matter of weeks rather than hours. So Yeah, that's difficult. Um, maybe we could ask people, actually. I, um, I would like to know if anyone would like to tell us which part of the process would you like to see? So do you want to see a blank canvas going into what it looks like three hours later? Or are people more interested in seeing um, how I progress from a block in? So like an initial, you know, this is roughly where everything is. Yeah. And how I progress from that stage towards a more um, refined and finished product. Okay. Um, 
Well, I'll tell you and what, have to do either, what we'll yeah. say is to that so that we can react quickly to it is follow us on Instagram. Um, and so you've either got Ruth's Instagram and I'll put them all in the comments below or follow the workshops in Yorkshire on Instagram um, and send your thoughts through to either of those. Um, I only say that because then we know we can monitor it over the next couple of weeks because it is going to be literally in you know a couple of weeks time. Um, but y you're right. It, it's, it's tricky to be able to, to, portray what you're going to portray in just a short time um but i think you'll nail it i've seen you do a la prima at that level um and, and with that kind of time frame so you, you'll be fine um of course we wish it was longer but that's perhaps for another time but um the, the question i was going to ask you though is anybody who wants to send questions ahead of time um we're openly encouraging folks to get in touch and um they can email ourselves or yourself um, and again I'll put that at the bottom of the um, bottom of here but if you could send them over to us I can then be asking Ruth on the day um, so that we've got people live participating but also afterwards it's going to be recorded so we're, we're going to make sure that the whole thing is recorded and edited and then put out on the website so that's workshopsinyorkshire.com um, for anybody who's wondering. Um, and you can sign up through there. You can ask us questions through there. You can ask Ruth questions through there. Um, and like I say, the recording of will be there. So Ruth, I'm so excited that, that you're willing to, to go with us on this. Um, and we've already had so many people sign up. We only announced it a couple of days ago. Um, but we really have had people from all over the world already signing up in Australia and in South Africa and lots in America, loads of folks in Ireland. And it's just going to be really nice to be able to share a piece of you with them um, where they can't come over to Yorkshire. You know, we're, we're lucky that we're here, but they also they can't get here. So this is a nice way of us sharing that. So I'm, I'm really excited and I know it's going to go really well. So thank you so much thank for doing you, that. Thank it's you going to be brilliant. Me. No, it's, it's going to be brilliant. So I'm going to wrap it up um, and just say thank you to yourself, uh, obviously, for giving me this time. Um, I'm really hoping that folks who hadn't heard of you before are just intrigued now to go and find out more about you. And um, quite honestly, hand on heart, just support what you're doing because... Um, like I say, and I said at the beginning, Mum and I are, are massively in your corner and we just think you're doing a brilliant, brilliant job. Um, and so we, we want to root for you, not just because you're from Yorkshire, not just because you're a woman, not just because you're Ruth, but because of what you are and what you're doing. And it's, it's really um, just keep going. Uh, we're so excited to watch you progress and grow. So thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you. It's been lovely. All right, and I shall see you on the 4th of December. Not long, okay? Brilliant. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you, Zimmy.